Hello, my name is Michelle Roberts, and I am going to speak to you today about the big idea of data. I am speaking to you from the amateur sports capital of the world. Some folks in my state claim that it is the sports capital of the world, but we're here in Indiana. Here we love our sports and we also love our computer science. Speaking of computer science, I am faculty at um, Indiana University. And along with teaching the university students, I'm also fortunate enough to be the director of K-12 computer science outreach. And that part of my job allows me to work closely with students like you, and should you be in a classroom right now, with teachers like your teacher. I love the opportunity to chat about computer science. Um, I have to warn you that even though our focus is the big idea of data, um, I wanna make sure that you listen for connections. The big ideas in the CSP course are isolated. We look at them, you know, we call them out individually, but that's just an artificial construct so that we can do deep dives in each of that, those areas. In the real world, the threads, the big ideas are coupled, they're threaded. And I think it's helpful sometimes that we make explicit the connections. And so while you will be hearing mostly about data, I am gonna take the time to make connections to the other big ideas. I wanna tell you just a little bit more about um, me, not really me, but my campus. Indiana University is ranked as one of the most beautiful campuses in the world. And our computer science department is rather unique. It's kind of like CSP in that in one building, it's the Luddy building, we have computer science, informatics, data science, cybersecurity, computer engineering, statistics, and library science. So as you move around in Luddy, you will overhear conversations at the intersections of all of those areas, which is pretty darn exciting. And then perhaps coolest of all, up on the top floor of our building, we have um, a mobile. It's called Amatria. Um, it is a sentiment mobile. And it has um, sensors and wires that are controlled by software. And should you ever be able to come visit us, as it senses your presence, it will respond with music and light and, and the mobile will move a bit. Pretty cool and captures um, kind of a forefront of what we want you to learn a little bit about here in CSP. So again, if you possibly can, come and visit us. Let me advance my slide here. I wanna start our conversation with a little bit of a riddle. I'm gonna cue up the riddle for you, and then I'm gonna ask you to pause your screen and think about a potential answer. Okie dokie. So over here, what I want you to look at and guess, think about something some kind of activity, not multiple activities, but one activity that has the following pattern. It spikes every Monday, every Monday of every week of every month throughout the year. And then it spikes really big in February and June. And then biggest of all, it spikes in March and December. Can you think of what might be happening that would um, take on that kind of behavior as a data set? So just pause your video for a second and give it your best shot. Okay, are you back? Any good ideas out there? 
some ideas that I've heard in the past are airline flights or um, the uh, consumption of chocolate. Um, this, uh, this data set, by the way, uh, comes from a TED talk given by a journalist named David McCandless. And if you ever find a moment, it is a delightful TED talk and I encourage you to watch it. Guess what this really is? This is a story of breakups of your age group. And so what McCandless and his data group did was they scraped, I don't know if you've worked with um, social media scrapes, they're software packages. Um, it goes out to a social media form. This particular uh, scrape was taken from Facebook and it just gathers data. You queue it up for what data to look for and it scrapes data from the site. And so the data that was chased were words like um, kick to the curb, X, breakup, words like that. And when the scrape was put together as raw data, it was charted. And this was the pattern about your age group that emerged. Whatever this was, we've said now that it's breakups, spikes every Monday. Why does it spike, spike every Monday? Any guesses? McCandless and his group um, reached out and sampled some of the folks whose Facebook sites they had scraped. And here was, here was the debrief that Student Your Age offered. On Mondays, those pictures of things that shouldn't have happened over the weekend come out. And if people get busted for those weekend pictures, the breakup comes on Monday. So that's a spike. The next level of spikes, um, February is Halloween. Um, Halloween. February is um, Valentine's Day. And um, this is a little bit of a sad story. So when folks were interviewed, they said it is really expensive to support a, a Valentine date. Um, and so if it isn't serious, uh, we're gonna break up before Valentine's to save that money. What do you think comes in June? Summer vacation. And this was interesting. Um, female respondents said, I'm gonna be honest, let's not you know, we'll see what happens when we come back from summer vacation, but don't want to be lying about any relationships. So let's just go ahead and break up for now. That was uh, June. And then March was spring break and same kind of, same kind of pictures coming out. And then uh, December is, um, Nope, not getting any kind of jewelry, uh, et cetera. And so one of the things after we step through the different topics here, the um, enduring understandings in this big idea unit, we will work our way back to um, societal impact uh, of data. I hope you have a little bit of a sense of um, these digital trails we are leaving about ourselves, uh, some of them intentional, and then some of them maybe not so intentional. Okay, let's start looking at um, the big idea module, if you will, has four major topics, binary numbers, compression, extracting information from data, and using programs with data. How does data explicitly re reflect in CSP? Well, at a minimum, um, of course you can uh, use data, and I hope you do use data in your create task. Um, but for exam coverage, close to 20, 25% of the exam is taken from um, the data module. My proposal for how to work our way through these topics is um, 
to kind of go from the inside out. And the good news is the module is laid out from the inside out. So first we're gonna to go to the very core of data. We're gonna be looking at binary numbers. And then we will come out a little bit along the way and look at data compression. We'll move to extracting information and then actually operating using programs with data. So that's the game plan. Let's jump in. We're starting here with binary numbers. And I always like starting with a little bit of a puzzler. What's the deal with binary numbers? Did we have to use binary numbers in computers? What science is what scientific principle is behind the selection of binary numbers instead of other numbering systems like a tertiary numbering system that would use three things? I'm not even going to ask you to pause for a moment. You won't be able to think of the science behind the selection of binary numbers. It wasn't driven by the science. It was driven by the money. I hope even if you haven't had a chance to um, take a lot of content, study any content in engineering, I think we all have a spidey tingly sense that Simple things cost less money than expensive things. This is why Henry Ford said, you can have any color model T you want as long as it's black, because once you get variety, I got to do more sales brochures, I got to have to buy more paint, I got to set up my manufacturing line with more variety. With complexity comes cost. And so the reason we focus on binary systems is it's about as simple as you can get. Looking at how binary switches, how binary numbers, again, were selected for use in computers, I want to use an abstraction to talk about how the binary numbers figure in to computing operation. And so I'm going to call the thing, the thing that um, is binary, I'm going to call it a switch. Now, again, that's an abstraction. And over the years, the actual physical component that played the part of a switch changed. Moore's law came into play. You may not know that it's called Moore's law, but you feel its consequences. All things in electronics get smaller, faster, and cheaper. And so we went from something, I shouldn't say we, I wasn't alive then, vacuum tubes to transistors to integrated circuits. And this progression, this evolution of componentry just keeps coming. Now, I want to give you my first outright digression. And to do so, I want to go back up here to vacuum tubes. Whoops, come back. Vacuum tubes is a digression about creativity. Here's the thing. When Motley and Eckert developed a computer called ENIAC, they proposed that it could help in World War II to calculate um, firing tables of, you know, if there's this um, uh, atmospheric pressure, if you're at this elevation, so on and so forth, here is how you should elevate your weaponry so that you get more lead to the target. Didn't get the project done in time, but one of the reasons that the scientific community wasn't all behind this idea of a computer was that vacuum tubes were broken more often than they were working. They had a ridiculously small, what in engineering we call mean time between failures. Would run for a little bit and then there she goes. And here was an innovation that um, Motley and Eckert came up with. When one, there were 50,000 vacuum tubes. When one of the vacuum tubes failed, 
instead of shutting down, well, it would pull ENIAC down, but instead of troubleshooting on the spot, they built up racks full of vacuum tubes and they could very quickly locate which, where, uh, within the 50,000 vacuum tubes, which rack had an errant non-performing tube. They just pulled, but they didn't know the specific one. They just could locate it to a rack. So their idea was, I'll pull the rack out, put another fresh rack in, and while ENIAC is still computing, offline, we will be troubleshooting the vacuum tubes. Now that sounds like one of those ideas where you go, I could have thought of that, but we didn't. So as you think about the creativity that computer science permits, it isn't just devices, it's also approaches. Why am I calling um, using an abstraction? Well, because we expect these these parts to keep evolving. What do I really need here? If I look at it from a higher level of abstraction, the reason this is a binary system is that I need a device that can switch between two, count them two voltage states. Now, you could actually build a computer with tertiary parts, in fact, the University of Illinois grad students, every couple of years, they build a computer using switches that had three settings. And it works. It's just much more expensive than um, a computer built with a switch that can only take on two states. If you want, and we do want to get a little bit deeper, what are the states? they actually are not on and off. You have to spend some money to get voltage, to get electricity down to zero. How we really describe these switches inside a computer, if we were to be precise, we would say this switch has insufficient voltage while this switch has sufficient voltage. We don't want to go through life talking like that. So we look for some abbreviations. And the first abbreviation was on and off. Can you see why maybe this was not the best of all choices? As we continue to work with more and more and more swishes, switches, um, just using an on and an off, I can't abbreviate any further. They both start with O. And so one day someone came up with a brilliant idea of we will use zeros and ones. So a computer does not have little teeny tiny zeros and ones. Um, instead, what we have is a notational script. That's what those zeros and ones are. They're a notational script that sits on top of a switch and it describes in a shorthand manner like abstractions do, it describes the voltage state of any given switch. And this is very similar to how um, musical scores work. The note on a piece of music is a notational script that describes the acoustic. And so when we look at these zeros and ones, um, that's what we're doing. We're describing voltage. I'm going to get a little, I'm gonna give up my idea of an abstraction and I'm gonna say, you know what? Let's call it a bit. A bit is one of those words that's a mashup. It stands for binary digit. And this is what we have to work with, and pretty much the only thing we have to work with as what we can use to represent all the different kinds of data that a computer can represent. What would you expect a computer to support for, you, for a seller to get your money? My guess is today, you're not gonna buy a computer that can't do text data, 
plus images, plus music, and plus calculation. That's a bare bones min minimum for you to purchase. And so in the next few minutes, let's figure out how a computer represents all those different data formats using bits. Change in my slide. And I'm gonna start off with um, text data, character data. Let's give ourselves one bit just one bit. How many letters of the alphabet can you encode with just one bit? Well, we could get together and we could make an agreement that with our one bit, if it had insufficient voltage, we'll say that stands for the letter A. If it has sufficient voltage, we'll just agree that that stands for the letter B. Now, obviously, we could have picked letters at random, but just to go through this in a systematic way, let's start at the beginning of the alphabet and work our way through. You're not going to buy a computer that can only talk, only talk letters or words made up of A's and B's. That's not going to fly. What do we need to do? We got here using binary switches because they were the cheapest kind of switch. So let's just add another bit for switch. So now I have two bits. How many different letters of the alphabet can I represent? If both switches or bits are off with insufficient voltage, we'll say that's the letter A. Notice that instead of having just one symbol up here to represent the fact that I have two bits, I now have two symbols here in my third column. So both switches off, the letter A. Left one off, right one on, letter B. The opposite, left one on, right one off, the letter C. And everybody gone crazy, both switches lit up, I got the letter D. This is working but it will take us too long to work our way through the entire alphabet. This is a kind of problem solving approach, by the way, called brute force enumeration. I would just continue adding more bits until I finally could support everything I needed. But in the interest of time, let's come at this from the top down instead of the bottom up. Let's, let's pose this question. Exactly how many characters do I have to support? Any thoughts? You be thinking about that. And let's think it out. Now, by the way, if I am ever fortunate enough to visit in your classroom, and I ask for you all to um, figure something out. I think in most situations, whether you Google it, whether you continue with brute force enumeration, whether you actually look down at a keyboard, those are all computational strategies. I'm gonna do that Winnie the Pooh thing where you just think, think, think. So let's figure out what we need. The alphabet, 26 letters, but we all know that um, lowercase letters are treated differently than up, uppercase letters. And so I don't just need 26 bits or switches, I need 26 times two. We got numbers on the keyboard from zero to nine that adds an engineering requirement of another 10. You can have all kinds of combinations with the function keys. Let's just estimate that there's about 25 of them. So if we add 52, 10, 62, 25, what are we up to? 87. I don't know my power just of 87. And so I'm going to round up not to 90 because I don't know my powers of 90. I'm going to go straight up to 100. What is the nearest power of two to 100? The answer, two to the seventh. If you multiply two times two times two, seven times in a row, you would be under 
100. You've probably already learned by now that while one bit is, you know, stands for one switch, you can't do much. We saw that on the previous slide. You got to take some bits together to be able to do much of anything meaningful when text is involved. And so you probably learned that eight bits makes a byte. But Here's a little bit of a riddle. <clears throat> if we look here at here, like I'm playing hangman, here's my seven bits. I can uniquely recognize every character, the on and off toggles for every character is maintained in a standard called ASCII. So I can represent every character, the space bar, the punctuation, the letters, the numbers, et cetera. I can represent all of that in seven bits. Why is a byte eight bits then when only seven of them are working to help me with text? This is a connection to networking and um, internet and security, you will learn that this eighth bit is performing a different function than its previous seven friends. That eighth bit is something called a parity bit. So when you get to that content in your course materials, please make the connection back to eight bits. And here, just to wrap up how text is handled, one of the myths that CS principles is trying to change is you all are not, not you. I'm sure your teacher has already done a great job of dispelling this myth, but some people believe that computer science people are the most dull and boring people ever. I beg to differ. So here is a fun fact. If Eight bits as is a byte. What do four bits have to be? Anybody? It's called a nibble. I'm not even making that up. If you wind up programming in the internet of things, ever smaller slices of bits come into play and they really are called nibbles, which is pretty fun. We don't, we built that into our standards. If you, if you look up um, exactly what four bits means, you will see that this is part of our standards to call that a nibble. All right, we've knocked off uh, text. Let's move on to pictures. Let me beg you to not be a hater. Drawing is not within my suite of talents. So here's a little picture of my cat Fluffy. If I want to represent this image in bits, and I do because that's all I have to work with are these switches, what technique could I possibly assume? Any ideas? Well, you get a hint of it, and many of you already know this. Um, we're gonna use a process called pixelation. And in pixelation, we digitize the images by just putting them in a Cartesian coordinate system. That's fancy for a graph. And if you look here, I can actually communicate instructions to in on the other side of my transmission. I take a picture of my cat puppy and I send this to you. Um, I can say to the, um, I'm just gonna call them magic fairies. I can say, go over on the top row by convention, we label the rows with numbers and the columns with letters. And so I can say, go to A1 and don't color that in at all. There's no, whoops, there's no content there in A1. 
there's no content in B1. There's no content in C1. As you get ever finer resolution of the picture, I can keep separating these columns ever smaller and the rows ever more narrow. And I can eventually get the kind of precision to describe the whiskers on uh, Fluffy's uh, face. When we get to section three and four, we will be working with Cartesian coordinate systems, but we will call the intersection of a row in a column a cell. Here, the intersection of a row in a column is a pixel. And um, <clears throat> we can use this approach, again, called pixelation, to draw not only black and white images, but by adding uh, the ability to handle even more data for every pixel, we can handle colored pictures as well. This is fantastic, except for one little problem. This takes, this approach, pixelation, takes all kinds of memory and all kinds of time to transmit. What kind of files do you get out of pixelations? These are bitmaps and GIFs. And you can see that with a lot of resolution, um, you're talking about a bunch of data. Um, JPEG bitmap files are typically very big. Um, and this is how compression started, by the way. Compression was um, duct tape for a pixelated image. What do I mean by that? Compression works by finding redundancies and minimizing them. And so you can see here, I have almost, well, over here I do, I have an entire column where nothing is involved. There's no part of my cat fluffy that's um, active over here in these columns. Instead of saying to the magic fairies, go to this pixel, do nothing, go to this pixel, draw nothing, go to this pixel, draw nothing. People notice that this is all redundant data and it takes much less time and space to just say, go to column A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and for the entire column, do nothing. This is the first piece of um, compression. Uh, compression now, um, every graduate student in computer science worth their salt develops um, a new compression algorithms. These are very famous algorithms. The big ones are patented. Uh, it is a big deal. There's a lot of money involved in being able to compress and compact uh, data. So the same technique, recognizing patterns and redundancy. Oh, sounds like computational thinking. This can be applied to all kinds of media in, in which um, digital content is involved. Well, after a while, you just can't duct tape anymore. And so people begin to look for a totally different approach to represent images. In the picture of my cat Fluffy, let me just go back and remind you, this is a kind, a category of pictures that devolved into primitive geometric shapes. And what that means is, look, you can see circles, right? What is the absolute least amount of information you need to know about a circle to be able to draw it? And it turns out you just need to know three things. You need to know the X and Y. So here's two of my three things. I need to know the coordinate of this focal point of the circle. And the only other thing I need to know is this radian sweep, how far it is from this dot to the outside. And here is what is so amazing about this approach. If you give me those three pieces of information, I not only can draw your circle exactly to scale, but I can put it wherever you want me to put it on the screen. So compare just three pieces of information 
to all the information that we had in play before, as we look at all these, you know, pixel pieces of information. To heck with that. I'm just going to send you the formula and you're going to recreate Fluffy on the other side. If you create an image using this approach, so this is not pixelation, this is a formulaic approach, you're going to get a GIF. And this is why GIFs are so much smaller than JPEGs, because I am using geometry. You would send me different data points to draw a rectangle, different data points, you know. So <clears throat> when do you choose what to use? There is so much money involved in transmitting and storing that um, imagine a picture of Florida, the inner part of that map, you could, you could express that um, using this uh, geometry, just make a rectangle as big as you can make or a circle as big as you can make. But the coastline, we would want to pixelate the coastline. So you don't just have to choose between one approach or the other. You actually could produce images that are a reflection of both. With this in mind, and notice that we have talked about, look, there's lots of dead space. And this blank pixel area here is redundant with this blank pixel area there. And so we now should have a better understanding of how using binary numbers, we can um, create not only text, but now images. And we've picked up a little understanding of compression along the way. Let's tackle numbers. At this point in your um, class, you have probably dealt with translating between base two, our binary numbers, and base 10, our decimal set. A common technique, a common tool to use is um, a little construct called a flippy do. Just in case you are ever on a quiz show, um, the, these algorithms, the algorithm to convert between one base to the other, um, they are important enough to be named. And so if you're gonna move from base two, um, whether you're using a flippy do or some other techniques, if you're going from base two, to base 10, that's called expanded notation. You do a piece of expanded notation, regardless of what state you're in, probably by the third grade. Do you remember when you said 321? That's three times 100 plus two times 10 plus one times one, right? That's expanded notation. When you go the other direction, that's successive division. And I hope you realize that if you think about how that flippy do works, when you finish your programming unit in CSP, if you haven't done so already, you will have the capability to actually encode both of these algorithms. And while CSP doesn't require it, if you're ever looking for something to do, um, you can explore how using binary numbers, computers handle negative numbers, scientific notation, and um, real numbers. I appreciate your patience and attention. We're almost through. We need to talk about how computers handle sound. Up until now, when we considered text and pictures and numbers, we weren't doing any magic tricks. We were just converting one digital binary kind of format to another. But now to deal with sound, we actually have to translate from one kind of physical event to another. We believe that sound is expressed as waves in the natural world, it occurs as waves. It is in fact an analog event. 
And all the things we've looked at so far are digital events. Why do I have this crude drawing over here? If you wanted to graphically represent a digital event, it will look like a step function. It's a zero, it's a one, it's a zero, it's a one. If you want to represent a sound, it looks like a wave, it's analog. So here's a challenge. How do I take music, which is a wave, which is an analog event, and how do I shoehorn it down into a switch? And the magic is done through sampling. I'm not going to record the value here and here and here and here and here and here. No, there's a little bit of a infinity problem there, but leaving that aside, there is, um, we, we need to conserve the amount of data that we are recording because we have to transmit it and we have to store it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we knew how often we had to sample this wave so that you could, um, you could understand the acoustic? And it turns out there's a formula for that. It's called the Nyquist formula. And it's really simple math. I won't burden you with it. But you, it, there's a common sense side to the Nyquist formula. If you are listening to uh, some music that has really, really, really low notes, as well as really, really high notes, you're going to have to sample more often. So how often you need to sample is a reflection of the range of the song you're listening to. Okie dokie. Now, analogous to what we saw when we were looking at images, there also, this approach of sampling is like the approach of a bitmap or pixelation. There is a formulaic approach to sound, and those are called MIDI files. There's a piece of software that says, let's agree that this pattern of bits stands for um, uh, middle C, held for four beats, um, played staccato. And so you encode the information, not the sound, but the um, notational script for the sound. You send that to whoever your receiving party is. That party decodes it and um, it's formulaic. So uh, you have two approaches, one um, more conserving of space and time to transmit, and then the other um, more like a bit formula. We have covered, believe it or not, half of this module. Let's move to the remaining two sections. One is going to be extracting information from data. And then the last one is going to be using data in your programs. What do we need to know about extracting information? There is a process you perform, and it really is called a data scrub. Yeah, it stands for cleaning up your data set, but that's not as fun a word as scrubbing. So we're gonna scrub a data set. We're going to see what kind of conclusions can be drawn from a data set. And we're gonna talk ever so briefly about metadata. Here we go. Scrubbing a data set. <clears throat> Here is a little snippet of a uh, data dictionary from a Harry Potter data set. And you can see, I'm just showing two columns, names of people in the Harry Potter series, and then what their blood status is. Take a second and look over here. And do you see any problems when I perform, when I use software, or I write it myself to say, 
match on these words. Do you see any problems that I might encounter here? Well, lavender doesn't have an entry. How are we gonna handle no entries? It matters, we need to standardize. So we might have to drop a record um, if, if this missing data is critical. It may kick the entire record off, this whole row we would throw out. What else might you see? Look, some of these are hyphenated and this one is not. Um, so those kind as minuscule as those differences might sound, it will cause you to get a wrong number of records that move through in any filter. And so one of the most important tools in managing data is this creation of a data dictionary that walks across all the column headings. I'm not displaying any column headings here, but a, a column heading here would be name and a column heading here would be blood. By the way, um, the other thing I would have to scrub here is you want your data set to be atomic. You don't want a column that has both the first name and the last name. So you would get into a bit of trouble with inaccuracies, et cetera, um, in this little snippet of um, a data set. What kind of information can you legitimately draw from a data set? Data sets, the two main operations that you perform in a data set, um, you're going to impose a filter. We'll look at what that is in just a second. But the other thing you can do is to rearrange the data. And it's a, a way of taking different slices and dices of your data set. Those are called pivot tables. And um, I really encourage you to connect with um, capabilities to do filters and data sets. You will use them across all your disciplines as you um, move through your academic career. A big thing that we like to massage data to understand is to identify patterns and establish relationships. Let's hone in on relationships. Often you will find as you drill a data set is that at least one attribute is associated with at least one other. Now, one attribute can be associated with lots of different attributes, but the math of that uh, gets a little annoying. So we're just gonna stick with one attribute goes with another. Here's an example of, this is factual. Shark bites, the number of bites, um, are highly correlated with eating ice cream. If you look at ice cream sales and you look at reported shark bites, they go together in a very strong way. Does that mean that if you go to Baskin Robbins, you're gonna get eaten by a shark? No. There is something that we call a lurking variable that is behind, hidden between those two attributes, the attributes of ice cream consumption and shark bites. And it's summer days, warm weather. What do you do in warm weather? You're more likely to go to the beach. You're more likely to have an ice cream cone. And so it wasn't that those two things go together. Rather, it's that there's a third hidden variable um, it is surprisingly difficult to move a data finding from a correlation to a cause. For, for you to convince people that you have established a cause, you actually not only have to have a very high correlation coefficient, that's how we measure associations, but your high quantitative calculation of correlation has to fit within some theoretical framework. In other words, there is no science that would lead us to believe that shark bites and ice cream are connected 
in any way. And so um, that would be a tip that uh, we may have a correlation, but we are nowhere close to uh, causation. Um, I want to talk just for a second about how important visualizations are in data. So you can do all kinds of statistical calculations, the mean, the median, the mode, the correlation coefficient, you can do all kinds of factual information, but that may not result in cogent and compelling presentations to folks you need to convince. And let me tell you a quick story. It's the story of Dr. Samuelweiss. He was a physician, I'm pretty sure in the 1800s. And Samuelweiss had the crazy idea that there were these invisible creatures called germs and they jumped on doctor's hands. And what was happening was folks had invented the idea of a hospital. Up until then, most healing happened at home. Doctors came to you. People started building um, cities, started building hospitals. All of them were modeled after the first hospital. And the first hospital had on the ground floor, sometimes underground, the morgue. And then the next floor might be emergency. And then the next floor might finally be um, where you would go to have your baby. And what was happening because this crazy idea of little teeny tiny invisible creatures that jumped on doctor's hands, what was happening was doctors would go down in the morgue, start their rounds in the morgue, examine cadavers, why wash your hands? What? What do you mean tiny invisible creatures that jump on your hands? And then doctors would go up to the next floor and start treating patients and then up to the next floor. And no one could figure out why um, childbirth fatalities were spiking so high um, with the advent of hospitals. And here's Samuel by saying, look, this is before microscopes. He's saying, let's just try this. Let's just try washing our hands. And everybody said, what a silly idea. And um, it's kind of tragic. He gathered data, he showed it. Um, and because no one believed him, he, he, it was so frustrating to see unnecessary loss of life that um, he died in an institution. So, Without being that dramatic, it is an example of the power of using visualizations to present information you mine using data analysis. Sometimes uh, words are just not enough. Um, let's talk about filters. Filters. Honestly, if you like solving puzzles, you would love a career in data, in data analysis. Filters, let's kind of look under the hood and make a connection to programming. A filter says, I got a data set. It's got a whole bunch of rows. Make sure you check every single row. And let's say I'm interested in, this would never be required in your case, but I want to know, I'm a teacher, I want to know, I want a list of all the students who failed to, who turned in their homework. So let's go the positive way. So there's a big loop, an outer controlling loop. Keep checking until you've checked all the records. For each record, if they turned in their homework, so this means I have a data set, I have a data variable called homework one turned in. It's a Boolean, that's a type of data. If it's set to true, throw that record out. Now they don't throw the record out, they just suppress the, the display of the record. So make sure that uh, you process this inner um, branch and um, driven by this outer loop. 
and then you get a, a display of all the records that have not been suppressed. This gets a lot more serious than, well, I I'm sorry. Of course, whether you turn in your homework or not is serious, it's very serious. But here we are in the midst of COVID and here is a for real data set for real data set. As scientists were trying to figure out what the attributes were in susceptibility, what kind of data got captured? Here, you don't know what the relationships are. You don't know what is causing this. And so folks said, here's what we want to capture. Maybe it has something to do with age. Maybe we want to know, um, have they ever tested positive? Does smoking have anything to do with it? Does ethnicity have anything to do with it? Does race have anything to do with it? So there were so many of these column headings that were included in the first round, trying to get arms around what, what were factors that you could look at, um, what correlations happened, et cetera, that data scientists sat and had you know, discussions around what data we want to capture, because then we can run filters on it and try and um, work, you know, develop a model of um, what this um, um, COVID is all about and how it you know, spreads. So this is the kind of data sleuthing you would do. Um, okay, let me get to here. Um, this final uh, slide to me is the most important. Data has one of the biggest intersections with ethics. When you gather data, you want to work hard to ensure that your surveys, your data dictionary column headings, your data sets, are as unbiased as they can be. We have an expression in computer science, garbage in, garbage out, but drawing um, the wrong inferences can damage, can cause harm to whole segments of population demographics. And CSP is very much about um, computing for social good. So if you are interested in this area beyond uh, just an introduction to uh, the big idea of data, just make sure that you are um, committed to highly professional work. Um, this morning, I read an article that Indiana, my own state, um, miscounted some of the COVID fatalities. And I'm thinking you will see across the countries more states uh, adjusting their numbers. Why? Because we didn't do a great job at keeping track of things and counting things and running um, the right queries and running the right definitions in our, in our data dictionary. So your work has to be good and your work also needs to be ethical. With those two caveats, um, I think the big idea of data will appeal to anyone that likes a good puzzle. Have fun and thank you so very much for spending a little bit of time with me. Uh, would love to hear from any of you. Uh, and again, you have an automatic invitation to uh, visit Luddy should you find yourself in Indiana. Thank you.